What I'm going to do is uh, give you an update on osteoporosis treatments. And I've given you a list here of all the treatments we now have available. I'm not going to talk about them all, but I'm going to focus on those highlighted. So that's simple calcium and vitamin D supplements. We've already had a bit of discussion on vitamin D, so further clarification of that in a moment. Um, obviously, I'm going to talk about bisphosphonates, because that's what we use most of all. And we got several different bisphosphonates, and I'm going to talk about uh, them all. And we got oral and IV, and then we got a new anti-resortive tenosumab, which is a really interesting new drug. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Also, a few brief comments about teriparatide, which is the only truly anabolic treatment we have for bone. And then, lastly, I'll say a few words about strontium ranulate. As you're probably all aware, there are lots of new uh, safety issues with. Uh, strontium ranulate. So simple calcium vitamin D. So this is combined calcium and vitamin D supplements. That's your best treatment for your frail elderly patients. So those in institutional care, the housebound, lots of them, most of them are going to be vitamin D deficient. They're going to have some secondary hyperparathyroidism. And we know from studies over 20 years ago that we can reduce the risk of hip fractures and other non vertebral fractures by about a third with simple combined calcium and vitamin D. So about one gram of elemental calcium, 800 units of vitamin D3. And we've got chewable supplements. We've got caplets now, which I think has enhanced uh, adherence compliance. And we've got liquid formulation. So you've got several uh, different options. The important message here is that if you give vitamin D alone, there's pretty consistent evidence you are not going to reduce the risk of fractures in that patient population. You have to give combined uh, calcium and vitamin D. Where else would you use it? Well, you would use it as concomitant treatment. So if you're giving someone uh, alendronate, for example, you would, often want, you would often also want to give them some calcium vitamin D supplements. Not everybody needs a calcium supplement. You can tailor that to the dietary calcium intake. And if someone's got a very good calcium intake, say they're drinking a pint of milk or more per day, you don't need to give them a calcium supplement, but you might still want to give them uh, a vitamin D supplement. Some of the beneficial effects of combined calcium and vitamin D are on bone, and we have evidence for that. But also, there are a couple of randomised trials suggesting quite strongly that we're also uh, reducing the risk of fall. So it's probably a combination of those two effects. So that's... Um, calcium and vitamin D supplements. So what about bisphosphonates? Because that's what we use most of all uh, in the majority of our patients. And they're anti-resorptive, so they're osteoclast inhibitors. They will reduce bone turnover in general. They reduce bone remodeling. They will lead to an increase in bone density. And they reduce the so-called remodeling space. And they enhance or lengthen what we call secondary or passive mineralization. So you get more mineral and a rise in bone density. And thirdly, you preserve the structure of the bone, the microarchitecture of the bone. Put all those three together, and the bone is stronger. Now, we've got several bisphosphonates from which we can choose one. And that then begs the question of, are they all the same? And I think the answer to that is no. And there are various potential determinants of efficacy, as I've listed here. Things like how strongly do they bind to the bone surface, how strongly do they inhibit the osteoclast enzyme, things like convenience, tolerability, IV versus oral, and so on. So you could rank your bisphosphonates in order of efficacy with the best at the top. And that's what I've done. And at the top, I would put intravenous olodronic acid, and I'll try and justify that in a moment. Second, I would put the other intravenous bisphosphonate, ibandronate, and I think in general there's some data, some head-to-head -head data, oral versus IV, to suggest that that is true. Then I'd rank the three amino bisphosphonates together, equal efficacy, that's alendronate, resedronate, and abandronate, then off the bottom, etigenate, and that's not uh, so uh, effective. So why have I put IV zelegenate at the top? So it's just five milligrams once per year, it's an annual infusion. Well, this was the uh, fracture trial, uh, a well-powered trial, 7,700 patients. And if you look at those fracture reduction rates, they're very good. And when we saw these data for the first time, we thought, well, goodness me, we've never seen data as good as this. It's once a year, IV infusion, game over. Very uh, impressive uh, fracture reduction. However, we then uh, started to see a nephrotoxicity signal. 
and uh, that is uh, a limitation of the treatment. And indeed, below uh, a G EGFR of 35, it's officially contraindicated. And you've got to be careful with patients on diuretics, people with impaired renal function. You do run the risk of uh, worsening uh, renal impairment. You've also got to ensure your patient's vitamin D replete or they're going to get crushing hypocalcemia. Also, there are big logistical issues. It's an intravenous infusion, and mostly that's going to be, have to be given in secondary care. I know not always, but, but very often. The other big trial with zolegenate is this, and this is a post-hip fracture study. So these are men and women who've had a hip fracture, and they're randomised to zolegenate or placebo within three months after that hip fracture. And you see on the left a significant reduction in all clinical non vertebral fractures, and on the right you see a very interesting... 30% reduction in mortality, which we think might be related to uh, immunostimulation mediated through um, gamma-delta uh, T cells, and perhaps, for example, increases the uh, resistance to uh, infection. On the downside, I'm showing here post-hoc analysis, and this is a downside that applies to bisphosphonates in general, is that when you look at older patients, there's a bit of a tendency to see efficacy become less convincing, and perhaps particularly for hip fractures. And we sort of saw it for resedronate, and we see it again for zolegenate. So if you look at people over this, the age of 75 and look at hip fracture reduction for them compared with younger patients, it's lower. And there's a significant interaction with age, and you lose statistical significance for reduction in hip fractures in older patients. And that's a bit of a concern, bearing in mind most of these fractures are obviously going to occur in patients uh, older uh, than this. On the plus side, and again this has led to uh, a change in clinical practice, is that we have studies again from Ian Reid, the same group that looked at those meta-analyses for calcium, his group in New Zealand, have shown that after a single infusion of zolegenase, this is just one infusion, you have a very prolonged effect. For at least three years, your bone density will go up and stay up, and your bone markers will go down and stay down. So increasingly, I see a patient who may not have severe osteoporosis. I give them a single infusion of zolegenate. I can then discharge them from the clinic. I'll rescan them, say, in three years' time. Um, and I think that's an attractive approach that a lot of us uh, are now adopting. So it's very long-acting. And you also have some post hoc data showing that a single infusion of zolegenate, in terms of fracture reductions, if you look at the original RCTs, is just as effective as giving uh, three infusions, which is what uh, was planned in those original trials.